Section 94 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3, by George W. M. Reynolds. Scenes at the Blackamoor's House. When the Black returned to the parlor, where he had received, from the lips of Jeffreys, his revelations, which had produced a strange effect upon his mind, he threw himself upon the sofa, and gave way to his reflections. Although he had been up all night, yet he experienced no sensation of weariness. He possessed a soul of such indomitable energy, that by a natural kind of sympathy between mind and matter, it sustained even the physical powers to a wondrous degree we must follow him in the train of meditations into which he was plunged for the affairs in which he suddenly found himself interested through the confessions of john jeffreys were of so complicated and so difficult a nature involving too so many delicate points that to a mind endowed with one wit less of courage or with one gleam less of clearness those affairs would have appeared to be entangled beyond all possibility of a safe and prudent unravelling let the reader bear in mind that there were two distinct affairs in question although they might at a first glance be confounded because certain persons who were connected with one were also involved in the other the first of these affairs was the scheme of old death to avenge himself on the earl of ellingham a scheme involving many frightful details such as the exhumation of a coffin the capture of esther de medina and lady hatfield and the atrocity of blinding those fair and interesting creatures the other affair was the accusation of Mr. Torrens of a crime which he had not committed, and the necessity of proving his innocence. If those miscreants, Tim the Snammer, and Josh Pedler be informed against, reasoned the black within himself, they will be certain that either Benjamin Bones or John Jeffreys has betrayed them, and they will accordingly give a full and complete explanation, the result of which would be that the whole four would swing together but I am bound to save Jeffreys from that terrible fate, and God forbid that I should be the means, direct or indirect, of sending Benjamin Bones to the scaffold. And yet, on the other hand, knowing all that I have elicited from Jeffreys, and acting in the true spirit of that mission, which I have voluntarily undertaken, I dare not allow this innocent man Torrens to be condemned by a frightful combination of circumstantial evidence, when the utterance of a single word would prove him guiltless, and fix the crime on those who really perpetrated it how stands the matter then torrens must be saved on the one hand but the real murderers must be allowed to escape on the other oh this is a fatal necessity a dreadful alternative and yet it is imperious the black rose and paced the room with slow and measured steps he reflected profoundly he separated all the details of the two complicated matters which occupied his thoughts and examined them one by one in respect to the vengeance of benjamin bones it was thus that his musings were continued after a time that scheme must be completely strangled at once annihilated at its very commencement not for worlds must aught scandalous or degrading occur to arthur earl of ellingham not for worlds must the relationship subsisting between him and thomas rainford be published and proclaimed yes benjamin bones must be rendered powerless for the future and yet how can this be accomplished without permitting a legal tribunal to seize upon him the black continued to pace the room his sable countenance denoting by its workings the searching keenness with which his mind seized upon and examined each successive project that suggested itself as a means to accomplish all his objects and carry out all his aims in a manner certain to produce the results which he was anxious and resolved to bring about at length one particular scheme flashed to his mind and the smile which appeared on his countenance as his imagination seized on that project was an augury of its subsequent adoption he weighed it well in all its details he calculated its consequences he minutely examined all its certain results and he arrived at the conviction that though a large and even a dangerous measure it was the only one whereby all his designs could be effected having resolved to carry it into execution the black felt his mind relieved of a considerable load and seating himself at the table he wrote the following letter the account which rosamond 
torrens received from her father relative to the assassination of sir henry courtenay and which that unfortunate girl recited to you is strictly and substantially correct accident has enabled me to discover the real perpetrators of the crime and mr torrens shall be saved you will know in what terms to convey this assurance to that poor suffering creature whom you have taken under your protection the black sealed his note and addressed it to miss esther de medina manor house finchley he then repaired to the room where he had left jeffreys and caesar together and found that the former having partaken of some refreshments had thrown himself on the bed and fallen into a profound sleep caesar said the black you must hasten to finchley with this letter take your horse and delay not on your return come back by way of grafton street and tell dr lascelles that i desire to see him as soon as he can possibly visit me caesar immediately departed to execute these commissions and the black seated himself by the side of the bed on which jeffreys was sleeping nearly an hour passed and the man did not awake the black rang the bell and a domestic in plain clothes answered the summons wilton said his master remain here and keep watch upon this person pointing to the sleeper when he awakes ring the bell the servant bowed obedience to these instructions and the black left the room several hours had passed away and it was three o'clock in the afternoon caesar had returned with letters for his master who had scarcely made an end of their perusal when dr lascelles was announced well my dear friend said the physician what new scheme have you now in view and what new project do you require my assistance sit down doctor and listen to me attentively observed the black for many and strange incidents have occurred since i saw you last but perhaps you have been to finchley and in that case one of those circumstances to which i allude will have been made known to you no my dear friend replied dr lascelles depositing his hat and gloves on one chair and himself in another i have not had time to call upon the medinas since they removed to their country residence i have been experimentalizing on a most splendid brain which the surgeon of st bartholomew's hospital was kind enough to send me as a present but of what nature is the circumstance of which i should have heard at finchley had i called nothing disagreeable i hope i will explain to you in as few words as possible answered the black seating himself opposite to the physician the day before yesterday at about five o'clock in the evening mr de medina and esther were walking along the high road in the immediate vicinity of the manor to which they had removed as you are well aware in the morning when they saw a beautiful young creature sitting on the step of a stile and evidently a prey to the most heart-rending anguish they accosted her spoke kindly to her at length introduced her to tell just so much of her sorrowful tale as to enlist their warmest sympathies in her behalf they took her to the manor but on their arrival the poor girl was so overcome by illness fatigue and distress of mind that esther insisted on her retiring to rest yesterday morning she was so far recovered as to render it unnecessary to send for you in your medical capacity and esther assured her that she might not only look upon the manor as her home but that she should be treated with all the kindness attention and respect due to her misfortunes it then appears that the poor creature made a confidant of esther and revealed her entire story which shows how deeply she is to be pitied and how cruel were the circumstances that had driven her from her home and made her resolve to fly from london as from a city of pestilence the entire details of that story i will give you presently yesterday afternoon i repaired to the manor and the particulars connected with the young lady were confidentially narrated to me by mr de medina last night the metropolis rang with the rumours of a dreadful murder having been discovered the assassination of sir henry courtenay remarked the physician and the murderer a gentleman named torrens is in newgate the alleged murderer you mean doctor said the black emphatically and now prepare yourself to hear an amazing revelation for the young creature who found an asylum at finchley manor is the daughter of that alleged murderer and her name is rosamond but surely she could not have been in any way implicated patience doctor patience said the black on hearing last night of the arrest of mr torrens i immediately dispatched caesar to finchley with a note to mr de medina containing the sad intelligence 
and i find my letters which i have just received he added glancing towards the documents which lay open on the table that the news were broken as delicately as possible to the unhappy girl nevertheless she is as you may suppose a prey to the most lively grief and it has been with the greatest difficulty that mr de medina and esther have restrained her from flying to newgate to console her father let me now relate her history to you the black then detailed those incidents in connection with rosamond which are already known to the reader save and accept the dreadful fact that mr torrens has sold his daughters as virtue to sir henry courtenay for though the unhappy girl had confessed the outrage which had been perpetrated on her she knew not as the reader will remember that her own father had been an accomplice in the fearful deed i now have some further explanations to give you doctor continued the black and then i shall have completed my long long preface to the business which has induced me to request your presence here now in pursuance of that grand and difficult project the nature of which is so well known to you i resolved to enlist one of old death's confederates or rather instruments in my own service accordingly last night as soon as i had dispatched caesar to finchley with a note containing the intelligence of mr torrens's arrest i went into the borough and watched in the neighbourhood of old death's lodgings for i informed you a few days ago if you recollect that caesar had succeeded in discovering the abode of that terrible man well i kept not my watch uselessly for i soon beheld three men enter the house in horsemonger lane individually and at short intervals two of them were unknown to me although i have since found that their names were by no means unfamiliar but the third was a fellow of whom i knew something this was john jeffreys once a servant in the employ of sir christopher blunt now it immediately struck me that this was the very intelligent man who would suit my purposes for he is crafty intelligent and always ready to serve the best paymaster i accordingly resolved to enlist him in my employ and to this determination i was the more readily brought because i felt convinced that mischief was brewing under the auspices of old death the fact of the three men arriving so mysteriously singly and at short intervals on the same evening evidently by appointment and the length of time they remained in the place were sufficient arguments to prove to a far less experienced person than myself that a council of desperate men was being held for no good purposes it was not until past three this morning that the villains separated i had already made up my mind how to act and a hackney coach was ordered by me to wait beneath the wall of horsemonger lane i fancied that old death's visitors would depart singly as they had arrived and my expectations were so far realized that jeffreys went off by himself i resolved to follow him home first for i suspected that he lived at no great distance because i thought that if i could not succeed in inducing him to accompany me i should at least know where to find him on another occasion at his own door i accosted him and by working on his fears by means of my mysterious behaviour as well as by holding out to him vague threats that i was prepared to carry him off by force if he should resist me i succeeded in bringing him blindfolded to this house well done exclaimed the physician and so i presume you have regularly enlisted the respectable mr jeffreys into your service thereby securing the aid of a spy in the enemy's camp the very object aimed at the very point gained cried the black jeffreys under the joint influence of bribery and menaces is completely mine and he gave me proofs of his fidelity by revealing to me many interesting matters indeed it was providentially fortunate that i got him into my power and service just at this particular time as you shall judge for yourself he then related the details of the damnable conspiracy planned by old death and to be executed by his myrmidons against the peace of the earl of ellingham and the happiness of lady hatfield and esther de medina this man is a perfect monster ejaculated dr lascelles indignantly how is it possible that you can have any forbearance my dear friend set your retainers to watch for him have him captured and lock him up for life in one of the dungeons which he himself doubtless rendered serviceable to his own purposes on more than one occasion patience doctor said the black 
nothing must be done rashly nor without due consideration besides you are well aware that my object is to endeavour to reform that bad man reform the devil cried the physician impatiently you know very well that i ridiculed the idea when you first started it and i intend to try the experiment doctor observed the black calmly but firmly in the meantime pray listen to me in the course of the conversation which i had with jeffreys this morning he mentioned the name of torrens and to my surprise i found that he had lately been in that gentleman's service when rosamond told her story to esther the poor girl alluded several times to her father's manservant as i stated to you just now but if she did not happen to mention his name or if she did it was not mentioned to me i was unaware of the identity of that domestic and jeffreys till the latter himself suffered the fact to transpire then was it that i also received a corroboration of the truth of the version which mr torrens had given his daughter of those circumstances that led to the death of sir henry courtenay for Jeffreys instigated the robbery at Torrens Cottage. Benjamin Bones appointed two men to execute it, and those men assassinated the baronet. You have thus become the depositor of a very agreeable secret, my dear friend, said the doctor somewhat ironically. How do you intend to act? For my part, I consider the position to be embarrassing. For if those two men are arrested, they will perhaps inform against Jeffreys and old death and in the case you lose not only your new dependent but also the opportunity of trying your great moral theory which i call great moral nonsense upon the respectable mr benjamin bones doctor doctor exclaimed the black in a reproachful tone is this your friendship for me is this the way in which you fulfil your promise of assistance pardon me my dear fellow cried the good-hearted physician wringing his companion's hand violently if i talk to you in that fashion it is simply because i am deeply anxious for your welfare and that in consequence of certain circumstances which we need not specify i look upon you just as if you were my own son you know that i am ready to serve you by day and by night that you may command me at all times and my purse to its fullest extent a thousand thanks doctor for these proofs of generous friendship interrupted the black your assistance i indeed require on your purse thanks to the liberality of mr de medina and the earl of ellingham i shall not be compelled to make any inroad then in what way can i assist you demanded the physician i will explain myself continued the black but first i must tell you that the very two men who murdered sir henry courtenay are of the gang employed by old death to persecute the earl and the two ladies in whom we all feel an interest i mean georgiana hatfield and esther de medina this makes the business more complicated said the doctor because if those two men are arrested on the charge of murder they may perhaps confess not only that old death urged them to the robbery and that jeffreys was an accomplice in it but they may also state the services which benjamin bones hired them to perform respecting the earl and, and the two ladies thereby at once publishing to the world that thomas rainford was indeed the elder brother of the earl and propagating the infamous scandal relative to esther de medina having been the said thomas rainford's mistress you embrace the whole difficulty or rather the greater portion of it at once my dear doctor exclaimed the black delighted to find that his friend simply so minutely and with such keen perception into the affair the business presses in every way in the first place it is necessary that an innocent man should be relieved as speedily as possible from the dreadful charge hanging over his head and secondly the exhumation of the coffin in st luke's churchyard must be prevented this night certainly it must observed dr lascelles for if once old death knew that the coffin contained not the remains of thomas rainford the discovery might engender certain suspicions in the mind of such an astute old scoundrel as he in a word doctor torrents must be saved and yet the two men who rejoice in the names of joshua pedlar and timothy splint must not be handed over to justice observed the black such ought to be the policy adopted said the physician and remember that though these two men are not to be rendered up to justice they must be taken such care of for the future as to commit no more murders and accept no more employ in the service of such miscreants as old death of that i shall indeed take good care said the black 
but how will it be possible to save torrens without handing splint and peddler over to justice in his place demanded the physician you will be a clever fellow if you accomplish that difficulty i am prepared to encounter it doctor returned the black and you must aid me in the business are you so intimately acquainted with any magistrate or justice of the peace that you can invite him to dinner what an extraordinary question cried dr lachelles laughing how will my asking a magistrate to dinner serve your purposes only thus far responded the black that you would have the kindness to walk a little way with him on his return home in the evening and that i should have you both very quietly kidnapped blindfolded and carried off to some place where you would both have to receive and witness the statements made by two men named joshua peddler and timothy splint whom i shall have safe in my own custody within a few hours i understand said the physician laughing heartily capital capital but by the by when i think of it your old friend sir christopher blunt was gazetted two days ago to be one of his majesty's justices of the peace for the county of middlesex would he not serve your purpose or do you think the physician paused and looked the black steadfastly and significantly in the face he will answer admirably exclaimed the latter after a few moments reflection yes better than any other all things considered i will undertake to get him into my power without giving you the trouble to ask him to dinner but i must request doctor that to-morrow night at eleven o'clock you will take a lonely walk in some very retired spot and at a good distance off too so that you may lose all trace of the path pursued by your kidnappers you do not require two persons surely said lascelles yes it will be better responded the black a justice of the peace and a competent and credible witness do you happen to have any patient in the neighborhood of bethlehem for instance let me see said the doctor in a musing manner yes he cried an old lady whom i have not visited for some time very good observed the black then you can call on her to-morrow evening and between ten and eleven as you are returning on foot on foot remember you will be set upon by half a dozen ruffians he continued laughing who will blindfold you shove you into a chase and carry you off you will never be able to say whither i understand you my dear friend said the physician laughing heartily also your scheme is admirable and certain of success thus far then the business is settled observed the black at that moment caesar entered the room and informed his master that the man jeffreys had just awoke having slept uninterruptedly for many hours but you have not left him alone caesar exclaimed the black no sir wilton is with him was the answer given by the youth good observed his master then turning towards the doctor he added if that fellow were to open the shutters and look out into the street he might recognize the locality and i intend to allow him no opportunity of playing me false you act wisely said the physician who then took his departure while the black repaired to the chamber where jeffreys was remaining the man rose and bowed respectfully on the entrance of his master who having dismissed wilton seated himself and proceeded to address his new dependent in the following manner i have resolved how to act in the emergencies which have arisen and to which i have devoted my best consideration you will not only be saved from the consequences of your connivance with the robbery which took place at torrens cottage and which ended in so tragic a manner but you will likewise be rendered secure from the possibility of being in any way implicated hereafter my promises will be faithfully kept if you prove faithful but if on the other hand you deceive me i will find you out wheresoever you may hide yourself and you shall assuredly perish on the scaffold for you cannot conceive the extent of my power to reward nor of my ability to punish i have seen enough sir to be convinced that you are some great person said jeffreys and i assure you that you will find me faithful and devoted act accordingly to your words and you will bless the day when you first encountered me observed the black and now listen to my instructions soon after it's dark you will be conveyed away from this house and at the proper hour you will keep your appointment to-night with peddler and splint you say that you are to meet them behind st luke's church do you mean in the road which separates the two burying grounds from each other 
that is the place of the meeting sir was the answer very well continued the black is there any chance of old death forming one of the party not the slightest sir he loves to plan and plot but he usually pays agents to execute i could have wished it had been otherwise you will meet your two friends according to agreement and you will endeavor to keep them in conversation for a few minutes in the road between the two burial grounds this will give my people time to surround them as it were for it is my intention to arrest those two men this very night jeffreys looked alarmed and said they will be sure to think that i have betrayed them sir leave all that to me returned the black i will take care that they shall never have the opportunity of injuring you wilton the servant who has just left this chamber will conduct the expedition to-night and he will allow you to escape you will then proceed as quickly as possible to seven dials where old death according to what you told me this morning must have already taken up his abode and you will tell him that when it came to the last moment tim the snammer and josh peddler were afraid to undertake the business of digging up the coffin and resolved to have nothing more to do with him or his affairs but you will assure him that you remain faithful to him and that you can recommend two friends of your own who will be delighted to do all he requires for a quarter of the sum he agreed to pay peddler and splint if he accepts the service of your pretended friends you will make an appointment to meet him in some low neighborhood the day after tomorrow in the evening let the time named be a late hour and should he wish you and your friends to call on him in earl street raise objections as it does not suit my purpose that the appointment should be there it must be a place of meeting from which he has to walk home afterwards i understand all your commands sir said jeffreys and you may depend upon them being faithfully executed i rely upon you observed the black and after a few moments his consideration he added to-morrow evening at nine o'clock punctually you must be in wilderness row beneath the wall of the charter house gardens and i shall send someone to receive an account of your proceedings with old death and give you further instructions but once more i say be faithful be prudent and avoid any vain or foolish display of your money i wish you would have more confidence in me sir exclaimed jeffreys then after a brief pause he said as an idea struck him i have a great deal of money about me sir and i wish you would take care of it for me now i am convinced of your honest intentions my good fellow said his master in a kinder tone than he had yet adopted towards the man if you propose to leave your money with me as a guarantee of your good faith i do not now require any such security but if your object be to place it in safety i will accept the trust well sir let it be in the way you have just mentioned returned jeffreys here is a drawer lock up anything you choose therein and take the key with you said the black jeffreys did as he was desired wilton was again summoned an excellent dinner was supplied the new dependent and the servant who was appointed to remain with him and the black retired to his own apartment soon after it was dark jeffreys was blindfolded and conducted to a private carriage which was waiting wilton accompanied him in the vehicle which after driving about for nearly an hour stopped at last and jeffreys on removing the bandage from his eyes and alighting found himself in an obscure street in the immediate vicinity of shoreditch church end of section ninety four section ninety five of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3, by George W. M. Reynolds. The Surprise. Jeffreys and Old Death. The deep tones of St. Luke's bell, proclaiming the hour of eleven, oscillated through the gusty air as tim the snammer entered the narrow road dividing the two burial grounds belonging to the church john jeffreys was already at the place of appointment and not many moments had elapsed after those two met ere josh peddler joined them bringing with him the necessary implements for the work of resurrectionists and which he instantly threw over the wall what a windy night it is said tim the snammer and how precious dark all the better for our business 
observed josh peddler i should have been here a little earlier but i had such a cursed deal of trouble to get rid of that bothering wench tilda she wouldn't let me come out at first and swore that if i did she'd follow me and did she follow you demanded jeffreys deuce a bit answered josh i was obliged to give her a good drubbing because she whimpered and then another to make her hold her tongue and afterwards we kissed and made it up and so she went quietly to bed what strange these women are to be sure if you beat em they're sure to love you all the more well are we going to stand here talking all night cried tim the snammer who knows but what there's a watchman about here i know there isn't said jeffreys because i made the inquiry in a careless kind of way at a public-house close by where i bought some brandy in a pint bottle that's capital cried tim give us a dram old feller i got it on purpose to keep the cold out and our spirits up said jeffreys playing his part admirably so as to gain time in obedience to the orders he had received from his master who was it that came with tidmarsh this morning to see the place where tom rain is buried i did answered tim the snammer smacking his lips in approval of the brandy and handing the bottle to josh peddler ah tom rain was a fine fellow said jeffreys i knew him well in fact i was with old sir christopher and frank curtis the night he robbed them what a bold dashing and yet cool-headed chap rainford was the finest highwayman that england ever had observed josh peddler returning the bottle to jeffreys beat your dick turpins and your jack shepherds all to no think added tim the snammer i say josh let you and me take to the road when we've done old death's business for him and sacked the blunt he's still got to pay us well well we'll see about it tim answered peddler but hush here's someone coming let's pretend to be walking on we haven't time to jump over after the tools the three accordingly put themselves in motion but jeffreys knew pretty well that the critical moment was now at hand tim the snammer affected to whistle a tune in a careless way and josh peddler began talking aloud on some indifferent subject meanwhile the footsteps advanced and it was evident that more than one person was approaching in fact there seemed to be three or four but josh peddler and tim splint had not the least suspicion of impending danger they thought that a party of jovial fellows were returning from the public house an idea that was excited by the merry song which one of the persons now approaching was singing a few minutes brought the two parties within ten paces of each other when a sudden and suspicious noise was heard as of a rustling of clothes against the walls which bounded the road both tim the snammer and josh peddler stopped short alarmed and irresolute the next instant they as well as jeffreys were seized by two persons who leaped upon them from the walls and by those who had advanced along the road jeffreys was liberated the moment he mentioned his name and he hurried away as quickly as possible from the scene of the surprise and capture but not before he had witnessed enough even in the obscurity of the night to convince him that josh peddler and tim the snammer were gagged and rendered powerless in the grasp of the agents of the mysterious blackamoor and such was indeed the fact before they were able to offer the slightest resistance or even utter a cry they were reduced to the condition just described their captors immediately divided into two parties each bearing off a prisoner so that the villains had not even the consolation of remaining together so well were all the arrangements made to ensure the complete success of the affair that a vehicle was waiting in the vicinity of each end of the road separating the burial grounds and the moment the prisoners were thrust inside bandages were tied over their eyes tim the snammer was the first who arrived at the place of the villains destination at the expiration of an hour from the time of his capture the vehicle which had purposefully driven about in a circuitous manner stopped at a house into which the prisoner was hurried up a flight of stairs he was then led through several rooms and at length down a long spiral descent of stone steps a trap shutting with a crashing sound above and a huge door opening and closing with the din of massiveness below then along a place in which the rapid tread of the numerous feet echoed with a gloomy and hollow sound as if in a paved and vaulted passage and lastly into a dungeon where the wretched man was deposited unbound and left to himself the huge door closing upon him such was the hurried progress and ultimate destination of tim the snammer in the strange and unknown place to which his captors had borne him the treatment experienced by josh peddler 
was precisely the same save that he did not enter his prison house with a good half hour after the arrival of his companion in inequity in the meantime john jeffreys proceeded to seven dials and found old death seated with mrs bunce toby having been dismissed as was usual when mr bones had business to transact in earl street to the public house to amuse himself with his pipe and his pint old death was surprised and alarmed when he beheld jeffreys make his appearance so early and unaccompanied by tim splint and josh pedlar is anything the matter inquired the ancient miscreant as mrs bunce carefully closed the room door no great harm only something to delay your business replied jeffreys well if it's no worse there isn't much harm done said old death but where are the others it's just on account of them that nothing has been done to-night answered jeffreys in two words they funked over the affair and have given it up what cried old death his countenance becoming grim and ghastly with rage and disappointment those scoundrels have received my money my good money thirty pounds each in advance and have given up the business you are joking jeffreys you are bantering me why tim the snammer would go through fire and water for such a sum of money as i promised him and josh pedler would sell his skin for half the amount all i can say is this mr bones continued jeffreys that i was punctual at the place of meeting at five minutes to eleven and when tim splint and josh pedler made their appearance they said they had changed their minds and should not proceed farther in the business and that i might come and tell you so if i liked the villains the rascals growled old death clenching his fists and working his toothless jaws about horribly as he spoke i asked them what had made them come to such a resolution proceeded jeffreys and they said that on account of torrens's affair they had plenty of money and it was useless to risk transportation by turning resurrectionists at least before it was all spent i argued with them but it was all in vain they went away to some public house and as i couldn't do the job myself i started off here to tell you what had occurred those men don't know me or they would not attempt to play their tricks in this fashion murmured old death then turning towards jeffreys he said in a louder tone and in a conciliating manner but you are a good fellow you are faithful and true as i have always found you and i am pleased with you the day will come when tim the snammer and josh pedlar shall bitterly repent of their conduct but in the meantime i am not to be disappointed in my vengeance i will not be foiled i have set my mind on a particular course and i will follow it there are other men in the world who can do all you require mr bones besides tim the snammer and josh pedlar said jeffreys i wish you had spoken to me first of all why so demanded old death hastily because i could have got a couple of chaps to help me to do all the business and who would have been contented with a quarter of the money you promised those sneaking scoundrels splint and pedlar answered jeffreys indeed cried old death eagerly you are a good fellow jeffreys an excellent fellow and you may always calculate upon having me as your friend but where are these people that you speak of who are they you don't know anything of them i fancy was the reply they are like myself servants out of place but they are a precious sight worse off than me in respect to money matters and would be glad to do any odd job for a ten-pound note or so and when can you see them demanded old death when can i see them repeated jeffreys in a musing tone as if he were giving the matter his most serious consideration why i might hunt them up to-morrow night in fact i'm sure i could and you can make an appointment for me to see them the night after said old death with fiendish eagerness to consummate the atrocious vengeance which he had planned i will undertake to do that mr bones returned jeffreys shall i explain to them the nature of the business before they see you or not no let me see them first said old death or stay you may sound em about the resurrection business but mention no names at all don't tell them who has employed you to treat with them mr bones is a good judge of people's faces observed mrs bunce and knows by their looks whether they're to be trusted or not generally speaking i do generally speaking said old death now for instance he added staring from beneath his shaggy overhanging brows full upon the countenance of jeffreys i know that you're faithful and i can trust you the man to whom these words were addressed met the searching look fixed upon him with an unchanging cheek 
and eyes that quailed not although for a moment he feared lest old death had suddenly entertained some suspicion concerning him but it seemed that the ancient miscreant with all his boasted skill in reading the human physiognomy was on this occasion completely at fault to tell you the truth jeffreys he continued i never liked the looks of the snammer but i thought that good pay would make him faithful however he will yet repent his conduct towards me and so shall josh pedler if it wasn't for their infernal treachery my vengeance would be by this time in a fair way towards prompt and speedy gratification for if that earl was allowed to go scot-free if i didn't punish him ay and fearfully too for all the injuries he has done to me i should go mad my property all destroyed my riches taken from me the very house that was so useful to me don't take on so mr bones interrupted mrs bunce in a coaxing manner come shall i put a little brandy on the table no gin ejaculated old death savagely then turning towards jeffreys he said you won't bring those friends of yours here mind the night after to-morrow it will be quite time to let them know where i live and where business will afterwards lead them to meet me when i have satisfied myself that they are of the right sort you don't think i would ask you to employ any one that i wasn't sure of exclaimed jeffreys affecting an angry tone no no my good fellow hastily responded old death but experience experience teaches us much and my experience is greater than yours come take a glass of gin and water and don't be annoyed i didn't mean to vex you say no more about it then observed jeffreys where shall we meet the night after to-morrow let me see mused benjamin bones aloud i have an appointment for that evening in the actual neighbourhood of st luke's church and there is a flash ken in helmet row called the stout house we will meet there between ten and eleven agreed said jeffreys have you any further instructions none none my good fellow answered old death only don't promise your two friends too much for the services required of them you see how i have lost already by those scoundrels peddler and splint but i will be even with them i will the two persons i shall introduce to you will do your work well and cheap mr bones replied jeffreys and i'm sure you will be satisfied i shall now be off because i may perhaps find them to-night at all events we meet at the stout house helmet row the night after next exactly said old death by the way if you run against tim the snammer or josh pedler just try and find out where they are to be met with and let me know i'll bear it in mind answered jeffreys he then took his departure well pleased at the success which had hitherto attended his proceedings in working out the designs and fulfilling the instructions of his master but who was that master and where dwelt the mysterious personage ah those were points which defied all conjecture on the following evening shortly before nine o'clock jeffreys was pacing wilderness row in obedience to the appointment arranged by his employer he was not kept waiting many minutes ere the youth caesar accosted him our master said the lad has sent me to inquire of you the result of your interview with old death and he desires me to assure you that he is well satisfied with your conduct of last night inasmuch as you effectually amused your companions until their captors came up but what of old death he has completely fallen into the snare laid for him answered jeffreys and he will meet me and my two friends he added significantly at the stout house helmet row to-morrow night between ten and eleven good observed caesar wilton and another of our masters as retainers both dressed in a suitable manner will meet you at that place to-morrow night shortly before ten so that you may have time to arrange the plan of proceeding together before old death makes his appearance i shall not fail to be there at quarter to ten answered jeffreys have you any further orders for me yes replied caesar listen to-morrow you must endeavour to find out the abode of one tidmarsh a friend of old death's that will be easily accomplished to-morrow night when i meet benjamin bones said jeffreys you are aware that the object of my appointment with him is to introduce to him two friends of mine who will undertake to dig up the remains of tom rainford the famous highwayman yes yes said caesar hastily well continued jeffreys i am supposed to be the leader of the party by whom that task is to be performed and i shall tell old death that he must send tidmarsh with me in the morning to point out the place where rainford is buried he will then let me know where tidmarsh lives or else will at once make him write a note to that person to arrange an appointment 
I understand, said Caesar, but suppose that old death will do neither, alleging that he will call himself on Tidmarsh and send him to meet you on the following morning at some place named. In this case, all will be wrong, because old death is to be captured tomorrow night on his way home. Had you not better call in seven dials tomorrow morning? Tell old death that you have found your friends and made the appointment with them for the evening? and then ask him to let Tidmarsh at once afford you the clue you will require to, to the grave of Rainford, asked the lad, his voice trembling and hesitating slightly, as he uttered the concluding words of his question. I understand you perfectly, Caesar, replied Jeffreys. Leave it to me to manage as our master desires. I will undertake to be able to give Wilton good news of Tidmarsh tomorrow night. Our master will rely upon you, said the youth. Meantime, farewell, and he hurried rapidly away, Jeffreys not offering to follow him. End of section 95。section 96 of the Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3. By George W. M. Reynolds. The New Justice of the Peace. Sir Christopher Blunt was seated in his library on the same evening which saw the interview between Caesar and Jeffreys, and his countenance was animated with a glow of indescribable delight as he glanced his eyes over several letters which he opened one after another. He was dressed in a very elegant manner, though he had somewhat punished his corns by persisting to wear tight boots in order to make his feet look small, and he might have felt a trifle or so easier at the waist if he had not tied his waistcoat strings so tight. But if Sir Christopher Blunt chose to enchance the fascinations of his appearance by converting himself into a voluntary victim of that all-powerful inquisition called fashion, if Sir Christopher Blunt, like a great many other silly old gentlemen of this age, smiled at his self-martyrdom with the equanimity of a saint broiling on a gridiron, it is no business of anybody save the Sir Christopher Blunt aforesaid. In spite of the pinching boots and the excruciating tightness of the figured silk waistcoat, the worthy knight was in a most glorious humour. It was not because fortune had favoured him with great wealth. He was so accustomed to riches by this time that a little poverty might have provided an agreeable variation, if only for the excitement of the thing. Neither was it the pleasing fact that his dear spouse had been in such a hurry to present him with a son and heir that she could not wait longer than three months after their marriage for Sir Christopher was already accustomed to the cries of the child, and, somehow or another, was growing less and less proud of his paternal honours every day, the reasoning of Dr. Wagtail relative to the premature birth appearing more and more illogical each time he sat himself down to reflect upon it. Then what was the cause of the worthy knight's joyousness and good humour on the evening in question? demands the impatient reader. To which query we hasten to reply, Sir Christopher Blunt has just been placed in the commission of the peace, and congratulatory letters from his friends were pouring in on all sides. Well, upon my word, this is very pleasant, said Sir Christopher to himself. I should not have thought that I was so beloved. Not a man in England has such a host of dear disinterested friends as I seem to possess. Scarcely does my name appear in the Gazette, when, whisk, in come the letters, by tuppenny post, and general, by hand and by conveyance, and some, too, are from people that really had no particular cause to be so devoted to me, people that I never spoke to six times in my life. But let's see, what have we here? A sheet of foolscap, completely covered, and crossed in some parts. God bless me! What a letter! Why, it must have taken the man an hour to write it, and I am sure it will take me too to read it. But who does it come from? Henry Atkins. Henry Atkins, who the deuce is he? Oh, I remember, the gentleman who allowed me a seat in his pew at Hackney, 
when I went to lodge there four years ago for the benefit of my health. Well, it's very kind of him to write me this long letter of congratulation, for I never exchanged ten words with him in my life. But let's see what he says. My dear Blunt, very friendly indeed. It was with indescribable delight and supreme satisfaction that I heard of your appointment to a position which no man in Europe can fill with more suitable dignity than yourself. Well, come, that's a good beginning. Your business habits, your high standing in society, your great name, your unblemished character, your brilliant talents, and your immense benevolence render you most eligible to fill that office, and most competent to discharge its functions. Upon my honour, it's very prettily worded, quite sonorous. It reads admirably, and this sincere and heartfelt congratulation is from a man whom I scarcely know. But he seems to know me well enough, however. In these times of agricultural distress and commercial embarrassment, in this age when England's heaven is overcast with lowering clouds, and the storms of anarchy and discontent menace us imminently, it is delightful to reflect that authority is so judiciously entrusted as in your case. That's the best rounded period I ever met with in my life. What a clever, far-seeing, shrewd man this Atkins must be, and what an idiot I have been not to cultivate the acquaintance of such a sincere friend. But it is chiefly your benevolence, it is principally your boundless charity, which is the theme of all praise, which is chanted by all tongues, and which is hymned beneath every roof throughout the length and breadth of the land. Well, I could not have believed that I was so famous, particularly on that score. However, it must be so, since Atkins says it is. Yes, my dear Blunt, very friendly indeed, it is your boundless charity, your anxiety to do good to deserving persons, that will hand your name down to posterity, and send it floating like an eternal bark over the waves of time. Ecad, that's splendid! Milton never wrote anything finer. I have never read Milton, it is true, but I am sure Atkins can beat him. Let us see how it goes on. It is under these impressions, and acting in obedience to these convictions, that I have ventured to address you. "'And I am very glad he has. "'I'll write to him presently, "'and tell him I shall always be delighted to hear from him. "'Let's see, where was I? "'Oh, ventured to address you for the purpose of soliciting your aid "'under very peculiar circumstances. "'Hm, I don't like that sentence so much as the others. "'I am a man possessing a large family and very limited means, "'and business having been lately indifferent.' I have fallen into sad arrears with my landlord. The style gets worse, that's clear. At this present moment I have an execution in my house for forty pounds, and when I look around me I behold a distracted wife on one side and a grim bailiff in possession on the other. This is the least interesting part of his letter. That period was not at all well turned. Milton beats him hollow there. If then, my dear Blunt, damned familiar though with his dear Blunt, upon my honour, if then, my dear Blunt, you would favour me with the loan of fifty pounds for three months. Confound his impudence! ejaculated the knight, throwing the letter into the waste paper basket. A man I know nothing of, who knows nothing of me, who never saw me ten times in his life, to ask me for fifty pounds! It is absurd! preposterous and the knight's countenance underwent a complete change which lasted for several minutes until its joyous expression was gradually recalled by the perusal of letters which contained congratulations only without soliciting favours presently a servant entered the room and stated that a gentleman named lickspittal requested an interview with sir christopher blunt show him up show him up immediately exclaimed the knight "'I have been expecting the gentleman this last half-hour,' he added, looking at his watch. "'It is now nine, and he was to have been here soon after eight. 
the domestic withdrew and speedily returned ushering in a thin pale elderly sneaking-looking man dressed in a suit of black which would not bear too close an inspection in the daytime but passed off well enough by candlelight sit down mr lickspittle pray sit down said the knight looking in contrast with the visitor just like a wax figure recently added to madame tussaud's exhibition so bright was the red of his animated cheeks so glossy his coat and trousers madame tussaud's exhibition so glossy his coat and trousers and so stiff and starch his attitude you have been well recommended to me mr lickspittle by a friend to whom your literary labours have given complete satisfaction and who speaks highly of you as a man in whom implicit confidence may be placed i am very much obliged to you sir christopher for the kind opinion you have formed of me answered the visitor in a tone of the deepest veneration and respect and appearing by his manner as if he did not dare to say that his soul was his own allow me to congratulate you sir christopher on your appointment as one of his majesty's justices of the peace i am convinced a worthier selection could not have been made well you are very kind mr lickspittle returned the knight all my friends seem to agree that the lord chancellor acted in a wise and prudent manner in placing my name before his most gracious majesty for the purpose and it will be my endeavour mr lickspittle added sir christopher pompously to discharge the duties of my office with credit to myself and benefit to my country it is not every one who possesses your advantages sir christopher observed his visitor in a cringing tone and with a sycophantic manner which would have disgusted any person endowed with good sense and proper feeling but which were particularly pleasing to the shallow-pated self-sufficient old bull at the same time said sir christopher whatever advantages i may possess whatever be those merits which have placed me in this this enviable and responsible suggested mr lickspittle meekly enviable and responsible position continued the knight adopting the epithets as coolly and quietly as if they were prompted by his own imagination at the same time he said it will not be amiss if certain measures be adopted to to enhance the popularity of your name observed mr lickspittle in the same low cringing and meek tone as before just so exclaimed the knight in fact i mean to take a high stand in the county to put myself more forward than i have hitherto done to attend public meetings and public dinners suggested mr lickspittle exactly said sir christopher in a word i want to to become a public man added the ready-witted gentleman whose business it was to furnish ideas to those who furnished him with cash in return you understand me as well as i understand myself mr lickspittle observed the knight it's my business sir was the answer besides you are so enlightened and enlightening a man sir christopher that you may be regarded as a lamp constantly diffusing its lustre even upon the darkest and most chaotic ideas pardon me sir christopher for being so bold as to express my opinion but it is the truth and i never flatter i am convinced you speak with sincerity my dear sir said the new justice of the peace playing with his eyeglass well then mr lickspittle to go back to our original subject the subject of this interview i think you fully comprehend me indeed i know that you do it is my object and my determination to take a high position in the county so that i may in a short time reckon upon the honour of being one of its representatives in parliament very easily managed sir christopher said mr lickspittle the electors would be proud of such a man as yourself pardon me for making the observation but i never flatter in the first instance however it is necessary that they should know you well now we are coming to the point my dear sir exclaimed the knight will you permit me to offer my suggestions asked mr lickspittle in a tone of insinuating meekness certainly by all means proceed well sir christopher in the first place i should propose that a pamphlet be written on some taking subject 
and addressed to your worship, continues Mr. Lixpittle. Suppose we say the corn laws, or prison discipline, or Catholic emancipation, or church extension, or parliamentary reform, or labour in factories. All good subjects, Mr. Lixpittle, all good subjects, observed the knight. But I do not mind telling you in private that I know nothing about any one of them. Of course not, Sir Christopher, exclaimed Mr. Lixpittle. It is not to be expected that a man of your standing will trouble himself about the details of such trivial matters. But which side will you take, the Liberal or the Tory? Oh, the Tory, by all means, cried Sir Christopher. Very good, my dear sir, said Mr. Lixpittle. It is all the same to me. I can write on one side as well as on the other. Suppose, then, we take up the subject of Catholic emancipation, which begins to make a great noise. Footnote. The reader will observe that this was said in the year 1827, before the emancipation of the Catholics took place. End footnote. A pamphlet must be got up, supposed to be written by a friend to the established church, and it must be in the shape of a letter addressed to yourself. I should begin by saying, Sir, the interest which you are known to take in this great and important question, the perseverance you have manifested in making yourself acquainted with all the bearings of the case, its certain results, and its inevitable influences, the staunch and long-tried ardour which you have evinced in maintaining and upholding the institutions of the established church, the numerous proofs which you have given of your attachment to the Protestant faith, and the fact that the eyes of the whole country are upon you as a man resolved at any personal sacrifice and at all individual risks to oppose all dangerous innovations and resist all perilous changes. These motives, sir, have induced me to address the following pages to you. Nothing can be better, Mr. Lixpittle, exclaimed the knight. I should, however, be glad, if you will, in the course of the pamphlet, allude especially, and more than once too, to the fact that I have been the artificer of my own fortune, that I raised myself from nothing, and that the greatest mistake the livery men of Port Socan ever made was to reject me as a candidate for the aldermanic gown of that ward. I shall not forget, Sir Christopher, observed Mr. Lixpittle. And you may add, my dear sir, continued the knight pompously, that you are well aware that circumstances have since occurred to make me rejoice at that rejection. I will declare it to be a well-known fact amongst all your friends, said the accommodating literary gentleman. And you may touch upon the zeal, the ability, and the efficiency with which I performed the duties of the shrivelty, the very arduous duties of that office observed the new justice of the peace i shall certainly do so sir christopher replied mr lixpittle and it will only be telling the exact truth you may likewise touch upon the reward which it graciously pleased the illustrious prince to confer upon me continued the magistrate i mean the honour of knighthood as a matter of course my dear sir and never was that title bestowed upon a gentleman better calculated to wear it worthily. "'I thank you, Mr. Lixpittle,' returned Sir Christopher, "'for your very flattering opinion of me. "'When can the pamphlet be got ready?' "'I shall set about it immediately, sir,' was the answer. "'The moment it is published, you must seize upon some point "'which I shall purposely leave open for discussion, "'and write a letter to a morning newspaper.' declaring that you agree with the general tenor of the work, but that you totally dissent from that particular doctrine. Decidedly, said Sir Christopher, you will then write a reply through the same channel, and signed, A Friend of the Established Church. That is my intention. We shall thus excite an interest relative to the pamphlet, and your name, Sir Christopher, will be kept before the public. The discussion may lead to a second pamphlet, stay exclaimed the knight smiling with the brightness of the idea which had just struck him we will manage better than all that you shall write a pamphlet which you must address to me in the terms just now specified by you but the work must contain throughout opinions totally opposed to mine 
and the object of the pamphlet must seem to be my conversion to your particular way of thinking then i must write another pamphlet in answer or rather you must write it for me and you must cut up hip and thigh and completely refute all the doctrines set forth in the first pamphlet in fact you must start a theory in that first pamphlet and knock it down altogether in the second which must be supposed to come from me a very ingenious idea my dear sir said mr lykspittal and just such a one as i should have expected from a man of your enlightened mind i admire the plan amazingly and will set to work at once very good exclaimed sir christopher i will write you a cheque for thirty guineas on account you will of course make all the necessary arrangements with the printer and stationer and you may apply to me for money as you require it i shall do the thing handsomely and spend fifty pounds at least in advertising each pamphlet mr lykspittal coincided altogether in the propriety of these intentions indeed he never was known to differ from a patron in the whole course of his life and having received the cheque he took his leave walking backwards to the door in homage to the great man who had just been placed in the commission of the peace almost immediately after the departure of mr lykspittal a servant entered announcing captain o'blunderbuss end of section ninety six section ninety seven of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3, by George W. M. Reynolds. Captain O'Blunderbuss again, another strange visitor. Sir Christopher Blunt was a man having many antipathies. Since his rejection for Portsoken, he had disliked all aldermen, individually and collectively, and since his union with the present Lady Blunt, he had conceived a violent aversion for all ladies' maids. He abominated Italian organ-players, and hated mendicants. Many other dislikes had Sir Christopher Blunt, but of the whole batch none was more settled, more genuine, and more sincere than his antipathy for Irishmen generally, and Captain O'Blunderbuss in particular. His interview with Mr. Lickspittal had left complacent smiles upon his countenance, but these suddenly yielded to clouds of the darkest description, when the domestic announced the name of that dreadful and dreaded man. "'Be the powers, and how is your worship?' roared Captain O'Blunderbuss, at the top of his stentorian voice, rattling the R most awfully, as he strode towards the knight with outstretched hand. "'Tip is your friend, my hearty,' and allow me to congratulate you on your appointment to the commission of the base thus speaking the captain shook with such exceeding violence the member which he metaphorically designated as a fin that the wretched sir christopher groaned aloud while tears started into his eyes be jesus and it's proud i am to own you as my friend sir christopher continued the gallant officer not observing the pain which his proof of extreme cordiality inflicted upon the worthy knight then throwing himself into a chair he exclaimed that rascal of a lackey of yours told me you was out but i wasn't to be deceived in such a gross fashion anyhow so i just told him my mind and what was that captain asked the knight in a half terrified half sulky tone that he was an insolent blackguard sir christopher returned O'Blunderbuss emphatically. And be Jesus, I was just on the point of teaching him how to behave towards his superiors when I saw the gentleman who was last with ye coming out, and he told me that your worship was at home. But I, I am very particularly engaged, Captain, said the knight, and if you would excuse me now, another time I shall be happy when you are passing this way. Be the holy poker, and there's no time like the present, interrupted the captain. And as I want just to have a little cosy chat with you, my dear friend, maybe you'll order up the whisky at once, and so save us the trouble of talking dry-lipped. Really, Captain O'Blunderbuss, 
stammered the knight. As a gentleman, uh, as a, um, a person being in the commission of the peace, I, I must protest against this, this intrusion. Intrusion, do you call it? vociferated the captain. Then, after a few moments' pause, during which he surveyed Sir Christopher in a most ferocious manner, he suddenly assumed a milder demeanour, and coolly ringing the bell, said, "'Be Jesus, I'll save you the trouble of giving any orders at all, my friend.' "'Captain O'Blunderbuss,' cried Sir Christopher, plucking up a spirit, "'I will not be treated in this manner. One would think that I am not master in my own house.' I have already told you that I am very particularly occupied with business, in consequence of my recent appointment to—' "'To the commission of the pace,' added the captain. "'Well, my friend, and we are going to drink success to the commission and the pace and all the rest of it. My good fellow,' he continued, addressing himself to the footman who now entered the room, "'bring up the whisky and hot water, with the sugar and the lemon, do you hear?' "'Don't do any such thing!' exclaimed Sir Christopher, now in a furious passion. "'Who are you, sir, that thus dares to give orders in the house of—of of an ex-sheriff and an actual magistrate?' demanded the knight, in a stern and pompous tone, for the presence of the servant seemed to be a kind of protection, beneath the shield of which the old gentleman grew every moment more valorous. "'But the powers, and that same is soon answered,' said the captain." rising from his chair and drawing himself up to his full height. "'Is it myself that ye are after inquiring about, Sir Christopher? Be Jesus, then, is Captain O'Blunderbuss I am, of Blunderbuss Park, Connemara, and it's a pair of pistols I've got for any man who dares to insult the same Captain O'Blunderbuss. So if you're for war, Sir Christopher,' roared the gallant gentleman, "'it shall be war, and if you're for pace, let it be pace.' and Boutin. The captain looked so very terrible, grew so awfully red in the face, seemed to swell out so tremendously at the chest, and raised his voice to such a thundering tone, as he enunciated his name and that of his imaginary estate, that Sir Christopher's valour, like the courage of Bob Acres, oozed rapidly away, and the servant drew back as near the door as possible, so as to be able to beat a retreat, in case of need, without any assistance from the warlike Irishman's foot. "'Is it war or peace?' demanded the captain, seeing that the enemy was discomfited. "'Peace, peace, captain, by all means,' returned the knight, in a tremulous voice. "'You'll alarm Lady Blunt, and, and make the dear baby cry. "'It's peace, and poteen, sirrah said the military gentleman, addressing himself in a tone of stern determination to the domestic, who instantly disappeared. "'Now, my dear friend, you're too impatient behalf,' continued the captain, resuming his chair and again speaking to the knight. "'You don't give me time to explain to you the nature of my business and the reason of me calling, for sure and it was to tell you how pleased your nevy, Mr. Frank Curtis, is, to think that you're put in the commission of the pace, and how sorry he is to think that you should have lost anything by that scoundrel, Howard, and how pleased he is to learn that your son and heir is flourishing, just like a green bay-leaf, and how sorry he is to think that your friend Torrance should have got himself into such a terrible pother, and how pleased he is to be able to send you back the trifling amount of five hundred pounds, which he was kind enough to advance him t'other day. "'Oh, he has done that, has he?' said Sir Christopher, rubbing his hands, and evidently getting into a better humour. "'Well, I am glad he has fulfilled the little engagement at all events, and I shall not hesitate to receive it, because, because I am sure he would not have sent it if he couldn't have spared it. "'Your nevy, my dear sir, is a man of honour, like myself.' cried the captain, striking his breast very hard, so that it gave forth a hollow rumbling sound, as if he had a small drum buttoned inside his frock coat. But, by the powers, here's the poteen, and it's over the glass that will settle the little business of the five hundred pounds. The servant placed the tray upon the table and withdrew. Sir Christopher then, with the politeness of a man who is about to receive the payment of money which he had never expected, 
did the honours in a most affable manner, and only seemed contented when the captain, having poured half a tumbler of scalding hot toddy down his throat, declared that it was excellent. "'And now for the little business,' resumed the gallant gentleman, and he forthwith began to fumble in his pockets, producing various pieces of paper, and discarding them one after the other, as soon as he consecutively glanced at their contents. "'That's not it, be the powers,' he said, laying down a piece of a playbill. "'And that's not it, be the holy poker,' he added, throwing aside an old account of his washerwoman's. "'Nor yet that, be Jesus,' he continued, similarly disposing of a tailor's bill. "'Why, what the blazes could I have done with the note?' "'Dear me, Captain,' observed Sir Christopher, in a tone of gentle remonstrance, "'it is very imprudent of you to carry notes about loose in that way.' "'So it is, my dear friend,' returned the gallant gentleman. "'But it's a fashion I have, do you see, and it's hard to break oneself of habits of the kind, be the powers. And here it is at last.' "'All right, all right,' said Sir Christopher, rubbing his hands. "'You can give me change out of a thousand pounds, can't you, my dear friend?' demanded the captain, crunching a bit of paper in his hand as he spoke. "'Oh, I can write a cheque for the difference, you know,' returned the knight. "'I presume it's a note for a thousand pounds?' "'Just so,' responded the captain. "'And as good as a Bank of England note, be the powers, although it isn't quite payable at sight.' "'Not payable at sight?' exclaimed Sir Christopher, in astonishment. "'Why, I never heard of the Bank of England issuing notes that weren't payable on demand.' "'He gad, nor I,' said Captain O'Blunderbuss. "'Be sure it isn't a Bank of England note at all at all. It's just my own acceptance.' "'Your acceptance?' groaned the knight, his countenance becoming suddenly blank. "'Yes, be Jesus, and here it is, my dear friend.' returned O'Blunderbuss, thrusting the crumpled slip of paper into Sir Christopher's hand. "'It's as decent a note for a promissory one as ever you'd wish to see, and as good as any of the paltry flimsy stuff that the Bank of England ever issued, or the Bank of Old Ireland either, and that's not even saying enough for it.' Sir Christopher, looking indeed like a knight of the rueful countenance, turned the document over and over in his hands, having glanced impatiently at its contents, which were drawn out in the usual style of a bill of exchange, Captain O'Blunderbuss having accepted it in favour of Frank Curtis for the amount of one thousand pounds, and at three months after date. "'Well, Sir Christopher, and what do you say to that, my old buck?' cried the captain, apparently surprised that the knight had not already expressed his admiration at the whole proceeding. "'What, what would you have me do with this?' asked Sir Christopher, in a hesitating manner for the fact is, he could not think well of it, and he dared not speak ill of it. "'Is it what you should do with it?' vociferated the captain. "'Arra! And be Jesus, man! Pay yourself out of it, and write me a cheque for the balance.' "'But, Captain, I, I, I am no discounter,' remonstrated the knight. "'This little slip of paper is no use to me.' "'Why, sirrah, and just now you was prepared to pay me the difference if it had been a bank-note, cried O'Blunderbuss. Do you suspect the thing, my friend? For if you mean to infer that it isn't as good as a bank-note, it's a direct insult to myself. And be the Lord Harry, it's me that'll resent it. With these words, the captain assumed a most menacing attitude, and Sir Christopher was already in a dreadful fright lest he should be compelled to submit to this new demand on the part of the extortioner, when the footman entered to announce that a gentleman was waiting in the parlour downstairs to speak to him upon very particular and urgent business. "'You must excuse me for a few minutes, Captain O'Blunderbuss,' said the knight, rising to quit the apartment. "'By all means,' cried that gentleman. "'We can finish the little matter presently.' and during your absence I'll pay my respects to the poteen. Sir Christopher accordingly repaired to the ground-floor parlour, where he beheld a venerable old man, who rose from the sofa whereon he was seated, to greet him. The stranger's aspect was indeed most imposing and respectable. From beneath a black silk skull-cap flowed hair as white as silver, and his form seemed bowed by the weight of years. 
he was dressed in a complete suit of black having knee breeches silk stockings and shoes with large silver buckles he supported himself by means of a stick and appeared to walk with considerable difficulty pray be seated sir exclaimed the knight already prepossessed in favour of his venerable-looking visitor who resumed his place on the sofa in such a manner that the light of the lamp should not fall upon his countenance which however appeared to be very pale and drawn up about the mouth with the wrinkles of age sir christopher blunt said the old gentleman in a tremulous voice i have ventured to intrude myself upon you for the purpose of soliciting a very great favour it is not of the ordinary nature of boons it involves nothing of a pecuniary kind for thank heaven i am placed far above the necessity of requiring such succour indeed i may say that i enjoy affluence be assured my dear sir returned the knight whose respect for his visitor was amazingly enhanced by this announcement be assured that if i can serve you in any way compatible with my honour as a man and with my position as an individual in the commission of the peace it is just because you are a magistrate sir christopher interrupted the old gentleman his tone becoming slightly less tremulous as he continued that i have now visited you not that any other magistrate would have failed to answer my purpose but i have heard so much in your favour the admirable manner in which you filled the office of sheriff the becoming way in which you presented the address to his present majesty when prince regent and which was so very properly rewarded by the honour of knighthood the dignified manner in which you left the ungrateful liverymen of port soken to ruminate over their folly in bestowing their votes on your unworthy rival in that grand contest in a word sir christopher the whole tenor of your life from the period when you were poor and friendless until now that you are a rich esteemed and influential member of society my dear sir my dear sir cried sir christopher absolutely whimpering for joy at hearing his praises thus chanted by a gentleman of so venerable and saint-like an appearance i really must know you better i i am quite at a loss to express my thanks my no thanks are required by one who proclaims the truth said the stranger shaking his respectable old head in a solemn and imposing manner you will yet be a great a very great man sir christopher or my experience which is of fourscore winters is miserably miserably deceived do you really think so my dear sir exclaimed sir christopher well i suppose you know or perhaps you may not that i am a very staunch and sincere friend to the established church that i am entirely opposed to catholic emancipation that i have made the subject a profound study and have devoted i wish to god lickspittle was here to prompt me he muttered in an undertone to himself i was not exactly aware of all that my good my worthy sir christopher blunt responded the old gentleman but i respect you all the more now that i am acquainted with those facts indeed i am proud and delighted to have the honour of your acquaintance an honour for which i have long craved urgently but let me return to the subject of my visit i was saying that you could render me a great a very great favour and at the same time convince the world how zealous how active and how worthy a magistrate you are my dear sir i shall be quite delighted to serve you cried sir christopher catching also at the idea of serving himself by performing some duty which would put him in such a comfortable and desirable light before the world the fact is most estimable man continued the stranger his voice again becoming very tremulous as if with deep emotion so that sir christopher was positively affected in no ordinary degree two men stained with a dreadful crime and now in a position which precludes the possibility of their appearing before a magistrate are anxious to confess their enormity to some competent authority and i have selected you for the reasons which i mentioned just now you have done me infinite honour my dear sir cried the knight i presume that this confession will be published to the world decidedly so 
interrupted the venerable stranger, and your name will go forth as that of the zealous, trustworthy, and highly respectable magistrate who was selected under such peculiar circumstances to receive the confession. Really, this is no favour which you ask of me, my venerable friend, exclaimed Sir Christopher, rejoiced at the lucky chance which thus gave promise of publishing his name in so remarkable a manner. I shall be delighted to serve you in that or any other way. When do you require me to visit these unhappy men? Immediately, at once, answered the old gentleman. My own carriage is at the door, and we can proceed to the place of destination with a privacy which the nature of the circumstances renders imperative. Sir Christopher rose and signified his readiness to accompany his venerable visitor, the joy which he experienced entirely obliterating in his mind all remembrance of the fact that he had left Captain O'Blunderbuss in his library. Giving his arm to his new friend, who walked with considerable difficulty, Sir Christopher led him into the hall, where the knight only stopped for a moment to take down his hat from a peg. They then issued forth together, and Sir Christopher assisted the old gentleman to ascend the steps of the vehicle which was waiting. He then leapt in himself, and the footman belonging to the carriage had just closed the door when Captain O'Blunderbuss rushed from the house, exclaiming, "'By the powers, and this is the greatest insult! "'Twas ever my misfortune to meet with in all my life!' "'Oh, the dreadful man!' murmured the knight, throwing himself back in the carriage in a state of despair. "'Sir Christopher!' cried the captain, thrusting his head in at the carriage window. "'Sir Christopher!' he repeated, with a terrible rattling of the R. "'Is this the way you mean for to treat a gentleman? "'Now, by the holy poker, if you don't come forth and finish the little business!' At this moment the captain was abruptly stopped short in a most unexpected manner, for the old gentleman, growing impatient of the delay, and perceiving that Sir Christopher was cruelly annoyed by the presence of the Irishman, suddenly dealt so well applied and vigorous a blow at the gallant officer that his countenance disappeared in an instant from the window, and he rolled back upon the pavement, exclaiming, Blood and thunder! in a tone of mingled rage and astonishment. At the same moment, the coachman whipped his horses, and the vehicle rolled away with extraordinary rapidity, while a merry laugh burst from the lips of the venerable old gentleman, who had so successfully discomfited the warlike captain. As soon as Sir Christopher Blunt had recovered from the alarm and excitement which the conduct of Captain O'Blunderbuss had caused him, he was seized with a strange surprise, not altogether unaccompanied by vague fear, at the sudden demonstration of vigour and strength made by his companion. This feeling was enhanced by the youthful tones of the merry laugh, which lasted long after the performance of the pleasant feat, and the knight began to tremble with apprehension when that same mysterious companion hastily drew up the windows and the wooden blinds of the carriage, the interior thus being thrown into a state of utter darkness. "'My dear Sir Christopher Blunt,' said a voice, now tremulous no more, but still evidently disguised. You will pardon me for having practised upon you a slight deception, which would indeed have been sustained until the end of the present adventure, had not the chastisement which I was tempted to administer to that bullying fellow convinced you that I cannot be an old gentleman of fourscore. In all other respects, no duplicity was practised upon you, for I am a great admirer of your character. The object I have in view is precisely the one I named to you, and I selected you to receive the confession of the two men because I knew no magistrate better qualified to answer the purpose in every way. A faint degree of irony marked the manner in which these last words were uttered, but Sir Christopher Blunt observed it not for he was now a prey to oppressive fears and vague apprehensions. "'Do not alarm yourself, my dear sir,' resumed the stranger. "'I pledge you my most solemn word of honour that no harm shall befall you. Circumstances which I cannot disclose render it necessary to observe all possible mystery in respect to the present transaction. To you the results will be just as I ere now promised.' You will receive and attest the confession of two criminals. 
and in forty-eight hours the contents of that confession, coupled with an account of how you became possessed of it, will appear in every London newspaper. Thence the whole transaction will be transferred to the provincial press, and in less than a week the name of Sir Christopher Blunt, Knight and Justice of the Peace, will be published and proclaimed throughout these islands. "'And you really mean me no harm?' said Sir Christopher, considerably reassured as well as consoled by this intelligence. "'Give me your hand, my dear sir,' exclaimed his companion. "'There, and now I swear that, as there is a God above us, you hold the hand of friendship in yours, and may that hand wither if I forfeit my word, or do you harm.' "'I believe you, sir, I believe you,' said the knight, pressing the hand which he held with convulsive ardour. "'But who are you that act thus mysteriously? What is your name? Where do you live? And whither are we going?' "'Not one of those questions can I answer,' was the reply. "'And it is expressly to prevent you from ascertaining the route which we are pursuing that I have drawn up the wooden blinds.' I must also inform you that ere we alight at the place where you will have to receive the confession of the two men, I must bind a handkerchief over your eyes, so that you may obtain no clue to the point of our present destination. Recollect, the event of this evening will give you an immense popularity. You will become the hero of one of the most romantic, one of the most extraordinary, one of the most unheard of adventures that have ever occurred or will again occur in this metropolis you will be courted by all the rank beauty and fashion of the west end to learn the narrative from your own lips and if you write a novel founded upon the occurrence added the stranger again in a slight tone of unperceived irony you will instantly become the most popular author of the day upon my honour my dear sir said sir christopher rubbing his hands i am not altogether sorry that that <clears throat> that you should have pitched upon me to become the hero of this adventure at the same time you must confess that never was a hero placed in a position so well calculated to alarm him the character of a hero is not to be bought cheaply in the world observed the knight's companion to become such a character one must necessarily pass through extraordinary circumstances, and extraordinary circumstances are never without their degree of excitement. "'Very true, my dear sir, very true,' said Sir Christopher. "'But I don't care how extraordinary the circumstances may be, so long as I run no risk. It's the risk, the danger, I care about, and I shall be very happy indeed if I can become a hero as you are pleased to call it, without undergoing any such peril. You shall become a hero, Sir Christopher, without having undergone the slightest danger, returned his companion. And that's even more than can be said by people who go up in balloons, or by men who put their heads into lions' mouths in menageries. Upon my honour, your observations are most true, most just, exclaimed the knight now finding himself almost completely at his ease. I suppose that if I do get my friend Lickspittle to write me, I mean, if I do write a novel founded on the occurrences of this night, you will have no objection to my putting in all our present conversation? Oh, not the least, cried the stranger. It is, however, a great pity that the night is calm, serene, and beautiful. Why so? inquired Sir Christopher in a tone of profound astonishment. Simply because it would be such scope for a splendid opening if there were a fearful storm with all the usual accessories of thunder and lightning, observed the stranger in a cool, quiet, but dry way. Only fancy now, something like this. It was on a dark and tempestuous night. The wind blew in fitful gusts. The artillery of heaven roared awfully. The gleaming shafts of electric fluid shot in eccentric motion across the sky, and so on. Upon my honour, that commencement would be truly grand, cried the knight, altogether enraptured by the turn which his companion had given to the discourse. And after all, as it would be a novel, I might easily begin with the storm, 
let me see i must recollect that sentence which you composed so glibly how did it run oh i recollect it was on a dark and tempestiferous night the wind roared the artillery blew in fitting gusts the streaming shafts of electricity shot across the eccentric sky eh that will do i think exclaimed sir christopher rubbing his hands joyously you see i have not got such a very bad memory my dear sir not at all answered the stranger and i should certainly advise you sir christopher not to lose sight of the novel if you publish it by subscription you may put down my name for half a dozen copies but i don't know your name cried the knight and yet he added after a moment's pause i suppose you must have one i believe that i have responded the stranger in a tone suddenly becoming solemn even mournful and it struck sir christopher that his ear caught the sound of a half stifled sigh but he had not many instants to reflect upon this occurrence nor even to continue the discourse upon the topic which had so much interested him for the carriage suddenly stopped and his companion immediately said now sir christopher you must permit me to blindfold you the operation was speedily completed and the stranger led the knight from the vehicle into a house the door of which immediately closed behind them up a flight of stairs they then proceeded and entered a room where the stranger desired sir christopher to remove the bandage as soon as this was done and the knight had recovered his powers of vision he found himself in a well-furnished room with the shutters closed the curtains drawn and a lamp standing in the middle of a table spread with wine and refreshments of a luxurious description his companion still retained the garb and disguise but no longer affected the decrepitude of old age and seating himself with his back to the light he invited sir christopher to take wine with him they then sat chatting for upwards of half an hour when the sounds of several footsteps ascending the stairs fell upon their ears the door opened and two men entered leading between them a gentleman with a bandage over his eyes the two men retired and the stranger desired the gentleman to remove the bandage adding dr lascelles you will pardon this apparent outrage the motives of which have doubtless been explained to you by my dependents i am led to believe that my presence is required to witness the confession of two criminals said the physician affecting complete ignorance alike of the mysterious master of the house and his affairs and if no treachery be intended towards me i do not feel inclined to complain much of the treatment i have already received i am delighted to hear you express yourself in these moderate terms observed the prime mover of these widely ramified schemes which are now occupying the reader's attention allow me to introduce you to a gentleman whose name is doubtless familiar to you sir christopher blunt then turning towards the knight he added sir christopher this is dr lascelles the eminent physician i think i have had the honour to meet sir christopher blunt on a former occasion at lady hatfield's said the doctor offering the knight his hand it is therefore a strange coincidence which has thus brought you together again under such circumstances as the present observed the stranger but you are both no doubt anxious to depart hence as speedily as possible and i will not detain you longer than is absolutely necessary he then rang a bell and in a few minutes four of his dependents entered the room leading in tim the snammer and josh pedlar both strongly bound with cords and having handkerchiefs over their eyes these bandages were removed the two villains cast rapid and searching glances around them the stranger ordered them to be seated and his dependents to retire and the business of that memorable night commenced End of section 97「Section 98 of the Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3, by George W. M. Reynolds. Chapter 92. The Confession. 
Sir Christopher Blunt, said the stranger, in your capacity of one of His Majesty's Justices of the Peace, you will have the kindness to receive the confession of the two men now before you. And you, Dr. Lascelles, as a gentleman of the highest respectability, will witness the present proceedings. Thus speaking, he drew a writing-table close up to the place where Sir Christopher Blunt was sitting, and the knight, inflated with the pride of his official station, and conscious of the importance of the part which he was now enacting, assumed as dignified and solemn a deportment as possible. A Bible was produced, and he directed the two prisoners to be sworn, the stranger administering the oath. "'Now, my men,' said the Justice of the Peace, "'it is my duty to hear and receive any confession which you may have to make to me.' but I give you due warning that it is to be published, and from what I have already been told will be used elsewhere. Remember also that you are now upon your oaths, and you must consider yourselves in just the same position as if you were in a regular police court under usual circumstances. Having thus delivered himself of what he believed to be an admirable prelude to the proceedings, Sir Christopher glanced complacently towards Dr. Lascelles as much to say, That was rather good, I flatter myself and the physician responded with a sign of approval. The knight then fixed his eyes in a searching manner upon the two prisoners, who, however, appeared to be much less in awe of the magisterial dignity than of the presence of the mysterious stranger, at whom they from time to time cast furtive looks of terror and supplication. Sir Christopher Blunt, said that individual, who throughout the proceedings spoke in a feigned tone, and sat in such a manner that the light never once fell fully upon his countenance, it is now necessary to remind you that a gentleman with whom you are well acquainted, and whose name is Torrens, is now in a criminal jail, charged with the murder of Sir Henry Courtenay. I heard the news with grief, and indeed with incredulity as to the truth of the accusation, observed the knight. Ask those men, sir, said the stranger in a low and impressive voice, what they know of that foul assassination. God bless me, exclaimed Sir Christopher, much agitated. Surely these men now before me are not the, the, the real murderers of Sir Henry Courtenay, added the stranger solemnly. Is this possible? cried the Justice of the Peace, surveying the prisoners with apprehension and horror. That's the confession we have to make, your worship, said Tin the Snammer in a dogged tone. Dreadful, dreadful, murmured the knight. Then, somewhat mastering his emotions, he asked, What is your name? "'Timothy Splint, your worship,' was the reply. "'And yours?' demanded Sir Christopher, making notes as he proceeded. "'Joshua Pedler, your worship. "'Where do you live? "'And what are you?' were the next questions. "'Where we did live, your worship, means,' said Tim the Snammer. "'But it doesn't much signify answering that query, "'since we don't live now where we used to do. "'And as for what we are, your worship can pretty well guess, "'now that we've confessed having murdered Sir Henry Courtenay, "'which was all through a mistake.' A mistake, repeated Sir Christopher. Yes, sir, continued the snammer, and I'll tell you all about it. Speak slow, very slow, said the knight, because I shall commit to paper every word you utter, remember. Well, sir, resumed Timothy Splint, it happened in this way. Me and my companion here, Joshua Pedler, took it into our heads to break into Torrens Cottage for no good purpose, as you may suppose. To rob the house, eh, said Sir Christopher. Just so, your worship. Well, we reached the cottage between twelve and one o'clock at night, or nearer one, I should think, and looking through the chinks of the shutters, for there was a light in the parlour, we saw a pile of gold and a heap of notes on the table, and a gentleman asleep on the sofa. "'You follow this man, Dr. Lascelles?' said Sir Christopher, turning towards the physician. "'Word for word,' was the reply. "'Go on, then,' exclaimed the knight. "'We opened the front door in a jiffy, your worship, and without making any noise,' continued Splint and we went into the parlour. Josh Pedler secured the notes and gold, and I held my clasp-knife close to the throat of the gentleman sleeping on the sofa. "'Did you know who he was?' demanded the knight. "'Not a bit of it, your worship. We took him for Mr. Torrens, as a matter of course,' continued the snammer. Josh Pedler went to ransack the sideboard and upset a sugar-basin or some such thing in the drawer. The gentleman awoke and was just on the point of crying out when I drew the clasp-knife across his throat. "'Merciful goodness!' exclaimed Sir Christopher, shuddering from head to foot and glancing uneasily around him. "'Shocking! Shocking!' said the doctor, with unfeigned emotion. "'The very knife that I did it with was in my pocket,' observed him, the snammer, when we was made prisoners and brought here. The stranger, who had remained silent for some time, now rose from his seat and took from the mantel the fatal weapon, 
which he laid upon the table before Sir Christopher, saying, This is collateral evidence of the truth of the deposition now made. Well, upon my honour, observed the knight, recoiling from the ominous-looking instrument. I have commenced my magisterial functions in an extraordinary, I may say, unheard-of manner. But let the prisoner proceed with his confession. I've very little more to say, your worship, answered the snammer. As soon as the deed was done, I could have wished it to be undone, and I know that my companion in trouble here wished the same. We didn't go with the intention of doing it. It come upon us by itself, like. And I hope mercy will be showed us, he added, with a significant glance of appeal towards the mysterious individual, of whom he seemed to be so much in awe. You and your comrade then left the house immediately, I suppose, said Sir Christopher interrogatively. Exactly so, your worship, replied Timothy Splint. And do you continue the night addressing himself to Joshua Pedler, admit the truth of all that your companion now states? Every word of it, your worship, answered the man. We must therefore suppose, observed Dr. Lascelles, that Mr. Torrens, upon discovering the dreadful deed, feared lest suspicion should fall upon himself, and buried the corpse in the garden where it was found. True, said Sir Christopher. And now, Joshua Pedler, you will inform me what you did with the money which you took away with you. I divided it, sir, and the big notes was changed into small ones, was the answer. When me and my companion here was made prisoners, we had ever so much of the money about us, and it was took from us. The stranger produced from his pocket a small parcel which he handed to Sir Christopher, saying, This is the amount taken from the two prisoners. Very good, said Sir Christopher. Then after a few moments' profound reflection he turned towards Dr. Lascelles, in whose ear he whispered these words. To me it is very clear that those men have confessed the truth and that they are the dreadful villains they represent themselves to be. But as this statement is to be published in connection with our names, we must render the evidence against those fellows as complete and satisfactory as possible. I am perfectly of your way of thinking, Sir Christopher, returned the doctor, also speaking in a low whisper. Since we are here on such an unpleasant business, we must do our duty effectually. Then those men should be examined separately in respect to the very minutest details of their self-accusing evidence, said the knight still addressing himself in an undertone to the physician, or else the world will immediately declare that the whole thing was a mere farce contrived by some of Torin's friends to save him, and of which you and I were the dupes and the instruments. A very just fear on your part, Sir Christopher, observed the doctor, who, from the little he knew of the night, would not have given him credit for so much penetration and forethought. But, said Sir Christopher, I hardly like to propose it to the gentleman who had us brought here. Oh, I will take that duty upon myself, interrupted Dr. Lascelles, and immediately turning towards the stranger, who was, however, no stranger to him, he said in a loud and firm tone, We wish to examine these men separately. Certainly, was the reply, and the mysterious master of the house forthwith rang the bell. Wilton answered the summons and was ordered to conduct Joshua Pedler into an adjoining room. When this command was obeyed and the domestic had led the prisoner away, Sir Christopher proceeded to question Timothy Splint again. You said just now that when you looked through the window you saw a gentleman sleeping on the sofa. Now did your companion also peep through the crevices in the shutters? He did, your worship, was the answer. And which way was the gentleman lying? With his feet towards the window and his head on that end of the sofa which was nearest to the door. And when you both went into the house, who entered first? Myself, your worship. And when you went away again, who departed first? I think Josh Pedler was in advance. In fact, I'm sure he was, because I remember shutting the front door behind me. Which side of the table were the pile of gold and the heap of notes on? inquired Sir Christopher, racking his brain for as many minute questions as possible. The money was all lying on a large book at that end of the table next to the window, your worship, responded Tim the Snammer. The knight put several other queries of the same trivial but really important nature and Splint was then removed from the room, Joshua Pedler being led back into his place. Precisely the same questions which had been asked of the Snammer were now put to the other villain, and the answers corresponded in the minutest particulars. There is no possibility of doubt as to the genuine character of the present scene, whispered the knight to Dr. Lascelles. I have been all along of that way of thinking, replied the physician. At the same time I admire the precautions you have adopted, Sir Christopher, and the skilful manner in which you have examined and cross-examined these self-inculpatory scoundrels. You really are of the opinion that I have done the thing well, eh, doctor? said the Justice of the Peace with a complacent smile. 
Well, I am rejoiced to perceive that I have given you satisfaction. Our unknown friend there may now have the other villain brought back again, so that the two partners in crime may sign these depositions. Dr. Lascelles intimated the knight's desire to the stranger, who forthwith caused Tim the Snammer to be reconducted to his place in the room where this extraordinary scene was enacted. Sir Christopher then read over in a slow and measured tone the whole of his notes, containing the voluntary confession of the miscreants and the subsequent examination. "'You, Timothy Splint, and you, Joshua Pedler,' he said, when that task was accomplished, will now sign or otherwise attest this document. The unknown rang the bell twice, and the four dependents, who had conducted the two prisoners into the room in the first instance, immediately reappeared, and on a signal from their master they loosened the cords which confined the hands of the villains in such a way that the latter were enabled to affix their signatures to the depositions, Dr. Lascelles acting as the witness. "'You may now remove those men altogether,' said the unknown." The four dependents immediately blindfolded them and led them away from the apartment, carefully closing the door behind them. "'I presume that Sir Christopher Blunt and myself are now at liberty to depart,' said the doctor. "'Not before you have each given me a solemn pledge that you will not publish nor even hint at the occurrences of this night until twenty-four hours shall have elapsed,' returned the stranger. "'For my part I don't at all object to give the promise required,' exclaimed the knight hastily, for the mystery of the whole proceeding had imbued him with the utmost awe in respect to the unknown." "'And I will as readily pledge my solemn word of honour to maintain that condition,' observed the doctor. "'In that case, gentlemen,' said the stranger, "'you shall be conveyed hence without delay. "'I need hardly enjoin you to use that confession, "'which you will take away with you in the manner alone calculated "'to save the life of Mr. Torrens, "'and relieve him from the dreadful charge hanging over his head. "'Rest assured that all shall be done which the emergency of the case requires "'and which we have now the means to effect,' said Sir Christopher." and now with your permission I shall take a draught of wine and water, for I feel somewhat exhausted with these proceedings. While Sir Christopher was helping himself at the table, Dr. Lascelles stepped up to the individual whom circumstances compel us to denominate the stranger or the unknown, and said in a low and hasty whisper, What is the reason of this delay of twenty-four hours in respect to the proclamation of Torrens' innocence? Because old death and others must be in my power ere the occurrences of this night be published was the answer, likewise spoken in a hurried whisper, or else they will suspect where these scenes have been enacted. But are you sure of capturing them? demanded Lascelles. Confident, was the brief but emphatic reply. The unknown then rang the bell and significantly intimated to Wilton, who answered the summons, that his guests were ready to depart. The domestic bowed and withdrew, but in a few minutes he returned accompanied by another dependent and the two domestics proceeded to blindfold both the doctor and the knight, the unknown apologizing for the necessity of renewing this process. He himself then conducted them to the carriage which Wilton had ordered round to the door, and into which the stranger followed them. It then drove away at a rapid rate, and after taking sundry windings stopped at the expiration of an hour opposite St. James's Church Piccadilly, just as the clock struck two in the morning. The knight and the doctor descended, having already bade farewell to the mysterious individual whom they left inside, and the carriage instantaneously drove off. End of section 98. Recording by Philip Gould.